So let it be no secret. My first thing I'll throw out here is that I consider you to be one of my best friends. Absolutely. And so their disclaimer has to be said that we do know each other very well. and We've, spent, um, we've had some adventures. Yeah. A lot of adventures <laughs> over the last 28 years. Yeah. And I remember even a few of them. <laughs> In the wake of that, we've toured together. Yeah. And we've played music together. Yep. I remember and playing like squash in your house, drinking Bombay <laughs> gin martinis, and I hit myself in the head with a racket. <laughs> Watching Pulp Fiction before anybody knew what Pulp Fiction was, that's remember? That's right. That's right. <laughs> but now that's out there, and we can certainly circle back to that occasionally. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you have a new record. Yeah. Rainier Fog. Rainier Fog. Seattle. Seattle. Mount Rainier. Your, your, your hometown. Where the band was spawned. Where, uh, yeah. Since you guys got back together again in 05, 06, yeah. this is the first record that you've made back in Seattle. Why this one? I just felt it was really important to reconnect with where we come from, you know, and Sean felt really strongly about us recording at what was Bad Animals and is now Studio, or right. what was Studio X right. is no longer a studio anymore we actually recorded the last record there it was the before. swan song it was yeah oh, it's crazy so it's kind of fitting it's also where we recorded the uh self-titled alice and chains record so the we third were, one we went home three of us have lived in la for the last two records william was living here too and mike and i as well i'm a part-time seattle and oaky you know guy but uh sean's up in seattle so i guess it was just logistics really we all three lived here, so it made a lot of sense. All our gears here, we were rehearsing mates, you know, we've always have. So, and if you really want to think about it, even Facelift and Dirt, uh, Dirt was recorded in LA. What? Facelift was half recorded in LA. We've, LA seems to be a place where we've recorded most of our records, actually. So, um, were you at subconsciously avoiding no. the connection to Seattle? It was purely practical. It was just practical. It wasn't really a whole lot of thought other than then it just makes sense to be here. Did being in Seattle for three months, making this record affect the sound, the vibe, the feel of it? Or would you, would it have been the same record if you recorded in LA or in Albuquerque or wherever the f I don't think so. I mean, I think all little things play a factor. Everything does. Relationships you're in, location where you're at. I mean, all, all of that, it right. soaks in. And uh, we actually finished uh, overdubs and vocals in Nashville. And that was a place we've never recorded. Have you ever recorded oh. there before? No. Yeah. We, we did a sit. I don't know Nashville at all. We, we did a yeah, sit yeah. there for a couple of months. And we basically did kind of vocals and solos and overdubs and crap like that. So that was also a cool town that had a little, fl little flavor too. So yeah, I, I would say it affected it. I mean, if, if you look back, we never have a plan, man. Right. We never really do. It's just like, okay, we're going to start and we know we're going to get somewhere. And we know we've done this before. We don't know how the f we're going to get there, but we know we've got there before. So we know what this is. When we get there, we can all look each other in the eye and we got 10, 11, 12 tunes and we're like, that's a f good record. We can stand behind it, and then we're good. Tell me about Sean and Mike's role in the creative process. Yeah, well, Sean's got a ton of ideas, and he, his brain works at warp speed for sure. He's got a lot of energy and a lot of ideas, not only just about music, but about like designing the light show, the live show, T-shirt design, you know, art stuff right. like that. We, we're all involved in it, but Sean's really taken kind of taking the reins over the last record or so. And that's something that he kind of enjoys doing. It gives him something to focus on, you know, and he's got a lot of great ideas and he's, you know, beyond just an unbelievably talented drummer and, and the way that <clears throat> he and I play together, it's just like a, it's a thing. And you know that uh, Sean's one of the drummers that actually continues to blow my mind in mm -hmm. terms of his creative thing. And one of the signature things of your sound is that he often doesn't play just a straight 4-4 four, four type of thing through. He has these really yeah. complex patterns. He does. While not shitting on the vocal or, or the line. Exactly. Like, that's what's yeah. really yeah. amazing well, about him. Yeah, super, backing it up. Super yeah. musical. Supporting it. Exactly. Super musical through all the little holes. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. Is that mostly from him or is that mostly you sitting down and going, try this type of feel? Or It's mostly he... from him. Okay. I'll give him a little direction here and there when, you know, it's like, where's the one? Because right. <laughs> I write some <laughs> up riffs that uh, don't really i know where's that the, conversation where's the one where's the, where's the one yeah, where do you hear the one yeah. <laughs> one thing i'm curious about when you're writing now yeah compared to when you wrote back in the day yeah is there a different process because you're writing primarily for your own lead vocal and for william's voice mm -hmm. versus the way that you wrote when lane was singing no it's pretty much the same you know i i wrote quite a bit back then too and Lane had his thing, and it was a uh, amazing, you know. And anything 
we had a really symbiotic kind of relationship. If I couldn't finish something out, I could always depend on him to f come up with something that will put it over the top. And he could too. Like if he had a partial idea, you know, he knew I could take it and take it somewhere else that maybe he couldn't take it to. And so mm -hmm. we kind of relied on each other that way. And we kind of created a language, I guess, the way that the, the language of Alice, whatever that is, we never really had any meetings or discussions or lofty goals of like, okay, this is what we got to do. It's just what we did, you know what I mean? And we kind of came to a place where the, the, the thing that I think that this band has always been, for better or worse, has been completely honest. Completely honest, completely gut-wrenching, punch to the nuts, to the point type stuff. And that can be really raw and it hits really raw in the music. And that was kind of, you know, once, once we found ourselves, that seemed to be one of the main ingredients. And that's something that we have always continued. So that was something I was able to carry on to the nor new kind of era of the band with William and, and Mike and Sean. And that process is pretty much the same. You know, William will come in with, you know, some ideas and stuff like that. And, and on this record, there was actually a song that's fully his, right? Yeah. So far under. Is that uh, the first time? That is the first time. time yeah, yeah other, the, other, the last three records. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, he and I usually work on stuff together. But coincidentally, that song, if you really want to know if he's into the band, like, you know, Alice has really kind of been known for bendy riff kind of stuff all the way from like, it ain't like that, right? So Lane wrote a few of those too, Angry Chair and Hate to Feel, the really bendy stuff. And that seems to be kind of part of the DNA and... Uh, I didn't write one for this record. William wrote it. <laughs> so he wrote the Bendy Riff song, so he's in for sure. <laughs> okay. 12, year, 12 years That's later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If there's any doubt, yeah. He wrote, okay. Yeah. So he, he, he got a, a pat on the back. <laughs> he wrote, he wrote well, the yeah. Bendy Riff, Alice you, Yeah. You can stay now. <laughs>I had had a pretty hard hit personally, you know, I like my grandmother got ill and pretty much from the time I was like about six or seven, my parents were my grandmother and my mother, you know, so, and we, we moved in with my grandmother and she got ill and she passed when I was about 20 and about six months later, my mother passed and then the house was sold and I was on my own. So my whole world was destroyed. And so that whole year was kind of death in my house watching my parents die. And, and that was a lot. And uh, I'd seen Lane's band, which was called Alice in Chains, like Guns N' Roses, right? Because they were big Guns N' Roses fans. But they're, And it was kind of like a glammy kind of, I don't know, there's like elements of like, I don't know, adamant and like rock and metal. And the band was okay, but I really remember him. I remember when I heard Lane sing, I'm like, I got to be in a fucking band with that guy. I think I talked to his guitar player, Nick, that night. I didn't talk to Lane, but it totally struck me like, that guy's badass, man. And when that had happened, uh, Nick and I had maybe had his number or something. I gave him a call and he's like, hey, there's a party up in West Seattle. Like my band's going to be there. And like, why don't you come up? So I think he picked me up, took me to, the, to this house party in West Seattle. And I met Lane. Within a couple of minutes, he was like, hey, man, nice to meet you, dude. Like Nick told me like, you know, the you've been going through. And if you got nowhere to stay, you can stay with me at my rehearsal place because I live at my rehearsal hall. It was just like a really extraordinary offer to just like right away, just like wow. kind of like yeah. offer me a place to sleep on the couch. You know, I'm like, yeah, I got nothing to do, dude. He's like, I might even be able to get you a job. And he did. Before I had met Lane, I had met Mike. And uh, a couple of weeks before I had gone to that party, I, had, I was trying out for some other band. And uh, it was this guy named Tim Branham. And I think the band was called Gypsy Rose. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You gotta be a gypsy so yeah, I was, somewhere I, in your so I was, past. I, I was staying with him for a couple of days, and uh, Mike rolled over. I remember he rolled over on a motorcycle, and I thought he, he was just a cool dude, looked cool. We got along really well, jammed for a couple of days, and then they decided to hire two other dudes, a different bass player and a different guitar player. We were in the same band for about two days, mm -hmm. trying out for it until we got kicked out. And then as I was living with Lane, I was like, I want to get a band together. I'm like, I'd really like to get in a band with you, you know? And he's like, well, I kind of got my own band and I've got this other thing that I'm working on. Like, it's kind of like a dead or alive kind of weird 
rock dance funk thing or whatever and he's like he's like but i tell you what i i do remember this guy sean kinney that i met a year ago in west seattle and he seemed pretty cool and i got his number i'll give you his number you should call him up i think it might be pretty cool for you to to meet him so lane gave me sean's number well i call sean and, and you know talk to him a little bit i'm like hey man you want to come down to jam he's like yeah no problem he's like well, what kind of thing you're looking to do you know like i'm like well i wouldn't you know, need a bass player too and he's like well, what kind of bass player i'm like you know i jam with this f-ing guy mike star like a few weeks ago that was f-ing killer man he's like well that's really funny he's my best friend and i'm going out with his sister <laughs> so, <laughs> i'll bring him down too so he did that's how that kind of started that's crazy and that's then it took crazy and then it took about a month of trying to convince lane to quit his other of bands yep. to to play with us and he wouldn't mm-hmm. do it so we basically decided to move on without him we started trying out play hard to get we yeah, started yeah, playing yeah. trying to trying out other singers yeah, yeah. in his rehearsal room that which we were living in right <laughs> And just horrible singers too. Like one of the guys was like a male stripper with like a like a big poodle do and kind of David Lee Roth and like uh, hankies on the f-ing ankle and all of that. Sh- hankies on the <laughs> ankle, <he> yeah. <laughs> okay, you know from the what knee the to, f- from, from the knee <laughs> to the ankle. You know that look. Anyway, uh, he's, he's like, all right, I can't let you guys f-ing move on with these f-ing clowns. I'll f-ing jump in. I'm like, well, you got to quit these other bands. He's like, okay, you got me. You guys did something that no other rock bands did at that time with your first four releases. You did an album, super heavy, your own sound, yeah. your own thing. Then you did an EP of stuff that was really radically different <laughs> than what you did on the right. record. Then you did a second record that was super. obviously linked to the first record, super heavy, crazy. Yep. And then you did another EP that was linked to the the first EP. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> where did that come from yeah and when you go to the record company after at that time because so much of it was controlled by the record company yeah. so, okay we're gonna put out you know a predominantly acoustic ep what were they saying like, yeah you know that putting out that first ep was that was a really bold move but and it was really consequential to do that not because it was a huge success because it wasn't it became one later on but what it did was open up the f-ing playing field for us it made it acceptable for us early on in our career to basically do whatever the f-ing we wanted yeah, to do exactly. instead of just have to be a hard f-ing heavy band all the time i think the impetus of it was just writing and f-ing around with stuff but it was cameron who i saw at the palladium show recently i hadn't seen cameron crow in a long time sure. but he gave us the opportunity to put a song into singles so like, but we had all this other f-ing around like some acoustic stuff and just whatever and and we recorded it all. So they gave us money to, to record wood for real. But what we did, was we used that same money to record all this other shit that we had. And a lot of it was acoustic stuff. Oh, okay. You know, we were like, I don't know that we were really thinking about putting it out. But Let me just make sure I understand. So the wood that ended up in the soundtrack of singles. And on dirt. Right, and yeah, dirt, yeah. which is the same version. Yeah, same version. Uh, the the four or five songs uh, from SAP were, were recorded, recorded from, at that, the same from that session. Got yeah. it. Okay, okay. Yeah. That I didn't know. I think we may have re-recorded them later. We might not have. It's it's a few years. My f-ing brain might not be f-ing right on that. But we had a meeting at the office, and Sean came in, and he's like, I got a great idea, man. I had a dream last night. I'm not f-ing out of a dream. We, we took those acoustic songs, and we put them out as an EP, and we called it Sap. <laughs> That's no joke. That's what he said. And we're like, okay. <laughs> Okay, sounds like a good idea to us. That's funny, but that's, that's really it's, funny. it's it's fucking true. Oh, that's it's fucking true. And it took a long time for facelift to break. It took like right. seven or eight months, man. You know, like of less we sold like twenty thousand records, and then when Man in the Box hit, it was all over. <sighs> like you know, hundreds of thousands overnight. But we had a pretty cool record company. Don Einer was he was really behind us, man, and he did a lot of creative. Shit. And so when we had this EP idea, they were cool with it too because. We had gone through it. The record had been successful. And then it was going to be a while while we went through a writing process to get to dirt, right? And we had this thing. And we're like, you know what? Let's not even advertise this thing. Let's just put it in the stores just for the fans and for people to stumble across. No ads, no nothing, no press. And they're like, we love it. It's great. But it was kind of a cool little, like an Easter egg for people to find. But then it ended up having a one or two hits on it it, it, did, it did it did thanks to kevin smith it was in yeah. clerks and uh got me wrong kind of became a hit a little bit later it was just kind of a gamble i'm so glad that we did that because it, it opened it, it set it, it set a wider it, playing field it, it, wi- it wi- widened the f-ing field for us you know friends don't let friends get friends, friends haircuts. haircuts yeah 
<laughs> so all joking aside, that was the back of uh, Mike's uh, bass the night you guys played your unplugged gig in. Uh, I think it was a front. I think it was the front of the bass. Was it the front? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the front oh, of the So base. that was in, yeah. in 96. That was the Metallica haircut era. Yes. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but that night, yeah. uh, the yeah. unplugged night, yeah. that was, apart from, I guess, one show where you guys uh, did a Kiss thing, you opened for Kiss. That was the end. Yeah, that was, it was like a one-off. That was the end. That yes. unplugged session is one of the most legendary yeah. of those unplugged sessions. That that time were a big deal. Everybody was doing them. No shit. And you guys, I guess maybe along with Nirvana and, and one or two other bands, had the very, very cream mm -hmm. of those sessions from yeah. MTV. What do you remember about that night, about playing and just being together and giving those songs the acoustic treatment in front of people? I remember being surrounded by friends like you guys. You guys were all f***ing there. And we had a lot of other friends there, too. And you're right, that and the Kiss shows, I think that was it. So for a period... Was there a sense of that? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, for a period of time, and you know this, knowing that my band's probably f***ing over and, you know, knowing that my one of my friends might be committed to going out that way, that's that's a tough thing to live with and still try to keep that internal and support the group. And also, none of us really wanted to control one another. We just wanted to f***ing exist. And if that's where somebody's going to go, then that's what they're going to do. And we all went to through that to some degree, and I don't think I was in great shape either. I think I was not feeling too hot either by my own hand for that f***ing gig i think that that's why all of that is in there because right. all of that background that i just described we were all living in that and knowing that we're coming to the end of it here unless something really drastically changes we're coming to the end really quick and i think part of that is in that performance as an outsider there as a, the celebration of the strength of the songs yeah for sure when they're stripped down because as you know when and, and musicians know this yeah it's like when it you better be there when you, <laughs> when you be can play an acoustic <laughs> instrument there better be a fucking song there <laughs> and, right. a, and a vocal melody and a lyric that's right that that's can right. stand on its own yeah. without yeah. the volume and without the weight mm -hmm. of the electric instruments and i just remember seeing that every one of those songs were so moving mm. in their simplest form